and I will just share the screen again and so you'll be able to see the presentation now i'll be using different media and i would like first of all to thank you to be here for these virtual experiences since travel has been disrupted i've been doing literally in the last uh, 15 months i've done some 200 to 250 virtual tours either public or private so it's been really really busy we travel all over italy and also some other parts of europe now um let's just fly over with the drone footage right over over florence and see this wonderful um historic city which we identify with the renaissance with art florence was in the uh, crib of the renaissance and we're going to discover today how that came to be what was the secret recipe that they had for a, a city which was re relatively small it only had 30,000 40,000 inhabitants at the beginning of 1400s when Giovanni di Bicci the first of the Medici who actually went from being a discreet and almost um you know uh, poor merchant to becoming one of the wealthiest bankers in the world by the beginning of the 1400s the medici were the wealthiest bankers in the world their bank being set right in central florence and we'll see how one of the symbols of the city it's its cathedral which was um sponsored at least the the dome the Brunelleschi Dome was sponsored by the Medici. So that power, that money of the reason at the beginning, which was uh, which had a lot to do with religion, and later on became something that went far beyond religion. In Florence, you will not be missing the the, the giant dome of the dome of Santa Maria del Fiore. Anyway today we will be starting our kind of virtual walk in florence from the train station because that's where most people get for to florence um uh, when they visit florence usually flying from a bigger city not many there is an airport in florence but you don't tend to fly from that airport is quite a small airport you tend to fly up to milan or to venice or to rome into italy and then from there uh, tra uh traveling the best way to travel in Italy is the high speed trains. Now, local trains in Italy and in general, local transportation, buses, small trains, they're awful, unreliable. But the high speed trains, the bullet trains, which go up to 200 miles an hour, I said it right, not 200 kilometers, almost 200 miles per hour, so over 300 kilometers per hour. So, in just over an hour, you can basically go from um from central rome to central florence or from um just over two hours from milan or venice to central florence florence it's basically um an historic city it was um the origins are dating back to the roman times of course most italian cities were founded during the roman times and part of the original forum part of the region ancient roman um center would have been here in this area which today you know as piazza della repubblica now uh, you might be disappointed to hear that many of uh, not the monuments but the houses the palaces the buildings which you will see strolling in the center of florence were actually built in the 19th century and this kind of renaissance like buildings here they are not from the renaissance they were built in the 19th century to look like they were in the renaissance so a, a large part of the center of florence is actually made up of buildings which were rebuilt to look like the idea of the renaissance that they had in the 1800s and most people don't know this but in the 1800s uh florence for about five years it was the capital city of italy italy was in the process of being unified for being a number of different uh independent uh, kingdoms and countries the kingdom of the church with the pope as a king in rome and central italy the kingdom of naples in southern italy with the uh, king of bourbon uh, milan and venice were under the austrian rule and uh, piedmont was independent and eventually was piedmont that conquered all the other little states and of course tuscany was an independent grand duchy which had some 
relationship with the also the um, empire in Central Europe, the Holy Roman German Empire. There's a giant um, arch, which is really, really big. It's like, uh, you know, six stories, pretty tall, and was as well built at the end of the 19th century as a result of a number of refurbishing and redesigning of the redeveloping of the entire city. In this direction, we get to the train station, which is very modern. It was redesigned during the fascism. Now, the fascists did a lot of harm to Italy. The war uh, destroyed the economy and the buildings, and that many people killed. We all know what World War II was like for Europe. But one good thing that they did, they did marvelous uh, train stations and a number of uh, efficient post offices and other buildings, infrastructures in the city center. Most Italian cities, they had a train station or post office or a government building, which dates back to 1930s and during the fashion. So this is the case also of this newly designed. Right as you step out of the train station, you can just cross the road. You have to be careful because with the trolley buses and the cabs and the mopeds, you can get run over very easily. There's another passage as well if you want to. And from here, you will see there's plenty of hotels You're straight out. We get to the first beautiful monument, which is the Church of Santa Maria Novella, which actually gives the name to the train station, train the main train, train station of Florence. It's called Santa Maria Novella. After this wonderful church and monastery that has also fantastic frescoes and chapels inside, there's the main chapel right behind the main altar in this church, which was basically uh, frescoed by Domenico Ghirlandaio at the time where Ghirlandaio was the master of young Michelangelo. Michelangelo was there actually, um, actually in the in as a as a teenager uh, studying in the workshop of Ghirlandaio. The main the main chapel, the Cappella Tornaboni, is right behind the main altar. There's a number of other uh, frescoes altar, and it's very beautiful. But from the outside, also the uh, church is stunning. He has this beautiful uh, marble, green marble and white marble, and the beautiful design. This design is due from it was made by one of the greatest and early architects of the re early Renaissance at the, at the beginning of the 1400, whose name was Leon Battista Alberti. Alberti was the first architect who went to look into the um, ancient Roman um, writings about architecture, especially Vitruvius and applied the rules that the Roman has stated of uh, to be a good builder, a good architect, including the concept of vetustas, uh, firmitas, and, and, and also the practicality of the buildings. Vetustas, vetustas means the beauty of the building. Beauty must be beautiful, must be practical, and uh, the utilitas, um, and also it needs to be uh, firm, it needs to be solid, built to last. And these were all basically um, used in designing uh, the concept of this building, using symmetry, using this beautiful connecting um, uh, elements on the side, which look like kind of marble uh, lays. On the outside, there are these astronomical machines here, which were designed in the 1500s by Ignazio Danti. And I'll mention this man again. He was a mathematician and astronomist. I read a question here. Somebody said, um, that Florence is from the 1800s. No, Florence is a, a, an ancient city, dates back to the Roman times, Florencia, the city of the flower. But uh, it, most of the buildings that you see today, except of course the, the you know some of the museums, some of the of the um, oldest buildings, the churches, many of the texture of building and they were actually rebuilt or highly restored in the 19th century. The city was um uh, highly highly uh restaurant restaurant now in the center of the square right in front uh santa maria novella there are two obelisks which are the last remnants of a of a, an ancient tradition which was carried out until the 19th century and then again when the city was um you know transforming a more modern uh, european capital was basically um abandoned so this is the facade again of santa maria novella there's a ticket to go in, but it's worth paying to see the inside. And this is the um, basically the Giostra dei Cocchi. Basically, it was uh, a kind of uh, a chariot race 
like the chariots that they would have used, you know, in the Roman times and the Renaissance again, uh, which actually raised around these two obelisks. The obelisks were displayed in the 1600s at some point. And you can see that they prepared a kind of arena, like a sort of amphitheater made of wooden seats, and the people tried to climb over to join the show. This was a tradition, one of the many traditions. It was very similar to the what was the Palio in Siena. Now, everybody knows the Palio, which was a similar race. In this case, the jockeys just run on the horses. There were no chariots, which is still held twice a year every summer in Siena, which is this traditionally, historically, the rival city of, of Florence. And uh, they, the Palio was revived, um, I think, at the end of the 19th century as an old Middle Age tradition, a Renaissance tradition, and it's still, you know, very important that the Senese really love them. But it wasn't the only city. Many cities in Italy had those kind of festivals and traditional races, but most of them, for health and safety reasons, were banned because horses died, the jokers died, sometimes the races were a bit unruly, so they smashed on the on the people, killing a few spectators. It was a bit messy. It looks a lot of fun in this painting, but it was really messy. The, still today, people are claiming to want to stop the races because every every time they do, for example, the Palio, one or two horses had to be put down. So there's a, also concerns. And uh, we want to know, we want to be a bit, um, uh, you know, off the beaten tracks. We don't want to do the classic things. Most people go to Florence. They only go there one or two days. They have a lot of wine, a lot of, a lot of Chianti or other, you know, Tuscany wines. And uh, you eat a steak, you eat a number of other, of other dishes. But, um, uh, you know, people usually see uh, two or three things, mainly I would say three things. And then, you know, that thing. Um, you take a stroll in the center, you take a picture on the Ponte Vecchio, you eat your your overpriced gelato somewhere in the way. And between, you know, in the center, basically the two main uh, attractions are usually the Duomo, and which we'll speak shortly, and the Palazzo Vecchio. And then the two main museums are, of course, the Uffizi Museum and the Academia Gallery. That's where the David is. But uh, there's actually a lot of Davids in... Uh, in Florence, there's three by Michelangelo alone, and there's several others made by other artists. Today, I will mention those about the uh, about Michelangelo. But as we that's that's the thing we're walking towards. Um, you know, we take Via Via della Spada here. We get to the to the um, to the uh, city center. We walk nearby. Um, nearby um, uh, Palazzo Strozzi here that you could see uh, right here. Today's uh, Palace for Temper Exhibition. It's beautiful uh, Renaissance, Venetian mansion. It reflects like the kind of uh, power and wealth that the wealthy um, Florentine families had back then in order to build this palace, which that also sent a very strong message of wealth and power. Anyway, not far from here, I will just use in a former uh, um, in a former uh, church in Piazza San Pancrazio. There is a very very peculiar museum, which is the Museo Marino Marini, and I'll take you inside this one. So from the outside, there are these lines. It looks like a church, but if you go inside, it actually full of contemporary art. Now, what I really love about this place is there is a Renaissance church um, completely restored, completely transformed into a very modern art gallery. Marino Marini was an artist of the uh, 20th century who um, basically was concentrated in the relation between the horses and the human figure, the uh, life force, the life energy, which is transmitted by these figures. I do have a small video I'll take us inside the Museo Marini Marini. It's not open every day. I think it's only open four or five days a week. You could see the former church with the Ruchelai uh, monument, and which is that kind of shrine we just saw. But inside, I really love the how the contemporary art pieces, they actually 
um, they actually um, uh, dialogue with the with the uh, ancient structure revived. And this, I think, is this kind of sort of things that you do not expect to see in, a, in an ancient city, which I think that Florence ha has embraced more than other cities in Italy that kind of identity that everybody wants to go to Florence to just soak up in the Renaissance, the Medici and Michelangelo and Leonardo and all the and the Botticelli's. But there's a lot more than that. And I really um, uh, uh, always love to, um, you know, just, you know, derail and go just to see something unexpected, something different that after all really really dialogues very well with the with the ancient historical city now especially if you are an artist or if you take a group of artists of your interest yourself in doing art they also allowed you i think you need permission but they do allow students or artists to sit there and do art and copy art and it's much quieter than going into a gallery or in the city center where i think you need to, to pay your fee to use the easel in central in central in central um florence we go so marino marini was very famous for this kind of um big statues uh, horses with men standing with arms up like this kind of life force life energy that spreads from the animal and the human there's a famous statue famous statue like this and as well in venice in the guggenheim museum which also has um kind of a boner i don't know how to say uh, to say nicely but um and everybody touches it and drops it so also if though you shouldn't probably the place also hosts temporary exhibitions this is a temporary exhibition down in the basement uh, which was the crypt once and of course this changed every now and then you can check on their official website what's going on there it's very very beautiful i think it's something really worth seeing now from here of course we can stroll going towards the duomo now the duomo it's a large complex i see someone mentioned the cultural story i will mention that later of course and the duomo is the real symbol of the power of the wealth and the success of the city as i mentioned before most of the wealth of the management not just of the manager most of florentine families came from banking now florence sits basically in a in a valley surrounded by nice and prosperous hills that are rich in uh water and 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 grass and trees and so this was the perfect area for of course having um, you know cattle and also you know the wine and a number of, of of nice products so since the middle ages the florentines became specialized in making wool in making textile in making leather and of course they started to trade them with uh, especially central europe but at some point they developed maths very well and maths gave them a, a much better control on the um um expenses and on the cash flows and at some point they realized that they could they didn't need to be paid up front they can sell with a credit to their clients allowing them to pay as they were selling their goods charging a little interest and as they started to do so they realized that they could make a lot more money by charging on the interest only rather than charging actually making goods and shipping them and taking the risk and all that of making stuff they could just lend money and there were a lot of money the problem with lending money in the middle ages and in the 13 and 1400s was that the church believed that if you did lend money and you just give somebody money and expect to be paid more just because of that that was considered a horrible crime and a sin which probably is as to try to sell to my bank every now and then but they don't really agree with that and you go to hell so how you how could you still be making money and try to avoid going to hell well by basically offering a part of this money to the church by building giant cathedrals so god will be happy and wouldn't send you to hell as long as you you know you did your business in a nicer way which allowed them to become super super rich now um the first of the medici who became very wealthy was a humble banker called giovanni de bici which also started in this kind of sponsorship of religious art and uh, his um his son uh cosimo the elder and then of course pietro the gautry and his son so many ago they brought the bank to the maximum expansion uh, uh the every 
everybody know Lorenzo. Now, the word bank and the Italian banco, banca, um, derived from the very table, banco in Italian is the table, which was right here. If today you go along Via de Galzaioli, this is the Or San Michele, halfway through, you find a little market, the one with the little piggy, which I it should be here somewhere. Is this one here? So now here, now today you see all, you know, um, tat basically, a lot of t-shirt with Italy, this. So, you know, we Italians, we don't wear this stuff. This is just made for tourists. So it's okay if you wear it. Our university in Italy, they don't make t-shirts. Uh, you're lucky if you get a, a printed degree. Anyway, the lodge now looks very different because this has been remade in the 19th century again. And it's very famous because there's a little piggy here, which is actually a wild boar which is the copy of a renaissance uh, bronze cast is right here the adult tourist people taking pictures with it people trying to put a coin into the mouth of the wild boar and then the, the, the coin drops into the uh, grave down underneath and usually there's a there's a beggar or a gypsy trying to get the money out again or getting some extra money and um, this was actually the actual market where also there were the bankers so they were just people with a bunch of money on the on with a table and they were just there saying oh i've got like cinque fiorini like i got fifty dollars and you can give me them back in three weeks or i got hundred dollars you can give me them back in in in, in till christmas and then they made this sort of deal so people said oh i'll get this cash and you know i'll pay it back and, and of course they made sure you did pay back why the Medici were most successful than others? There were other families that were very rich as well and made into banking, but the, the Medici banks are very, very rich. By the by the mid of the 14th uh, of the 15th century, uh, around 1450, they had banks all over Europe. They had a bank in Paris, they had banks in Germany, they had banks in 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 Bruges, they had bank in London. So they were lending all over. They had a set of rules, rules that most other banks didn't have. Their main rule was you don't lend money to royals you don't lend money to the church you don't lend money to people who tend not to pay back because royals you know the king can have your head cut off and it's just the king it makes the rule so it's not a good idea to lend to them because they might never pay, pay you back and also don't lend more than a certain amount of what you got so they were very first bankers that form banking from a shady a shady kind of uh, business to something dodgy and thing then under the table into a proper respectable established building and they made you know a fortune about that fortune that lasted about three generations because by the end of the 1400s in 1494 the bank went bankrupt and this also it's something that it, it the word bankrupt the concept of bankruptcy uh actually goes back to this this same market actually if you look well you have to go early in the morning or or very late at night after the shops are not there anymore into the, the, the market on the floor there is a white patch right in the center i can't i can't get to it right here but it's right in the middle and that's where people who didn't pay the debt were stripped off naked and they were with a naked bottom they were actually slapped right on the floor hitting the floor with a with a bottom humiliated saying he is not paying his debt and if a banker could not be you know could not run the business anymore and they had more debts than credits then they would actually literally with an axe break their table into pieces and that's the bancorotto that's where the concept of bankruptcy came from from the italian renaissance in florence so see there's a lot more than pizza and pasta and that kind of and opera that comes from italy actually also into banking why they were so efficient in developing banking well the idea of developing the banking was basically the the uh the um capacity that they had through maths and geometry to be able to calculate the interest how much was owned and the cash flow and this was be uh, was able thank to the uh, partita doppia basically the accounting system which is used, used today with putting your uh, expenses and your um, the amount that, that you need you expect to be paid in in two separate columns and doing the operation in this way and this which was invented by a friar called fra luca pacioli 
which was around the same time of Leonardo da Vinci in New Leonardo, that really boosted their economy. And one of the first investments that the Medici made, um, Giovanni di Bicci, it was actually the uh, decoration of one of the doors of the uh, baptistry of San Giovanni, the bas baptistry right in front of the Basilica. Now, you might be disappointed to hear that also the facade of the Florence Duomo, this was entirely made in the 1800s, late 1800s. The Basilica was built in the 1300s and uh, the dome was built at the beginning of the 1400s by um, uh, Filippo Brunelleschi. The bell tower in, in the at the end of the 1200s, beginning of the 1300s by Giotto di Bondone. So there were some of the greatest and most talented artists who worked here, but the, somehow the facade was left unfinished. And the, he had a kind of a painting uh, of, a, of some images which actually faded. Um, and then it was done in this kind of neo-Gothic style or only later on in time. But uh, the a part of the dome was left unfinished basically all this kind of walkway around here uh this is completely missing and at the very top there is the lantern where you can actually climb you can you have to book your tickets now if you want to explore the duomo area completely going inside the duomo to visit the just the church just the duomo it's free uh, you don't need a ticket, but uh, you need a ticket to get and, and a time book to climb up the, the dome. Now, there's over uh, 600 steps. There's no lift, so you have to climb in a very narrow place. So if you're claustrophobic, if you can do steps very well, I do not recommend if you have um, heart condition or things. So just, but it's if you can do it, it's definitely worth it. Or it's actually also something, if you go into Florence a few mo months or even a year or two, you can actually set your goal of training, making, you know, your few hundreds of steps. And that could be something, a part of your training to go on a tour. Definitely, um, of course, if you have health issues or mobility issues, you, know, you can get a transportation and you could see a good part of it, you know, by public car, by public transportation. But the best way to explore any Italian cities, really, but particularly Florence, is walking everywhere and even getting lost in the alleyways to discover amazing things. Now, the structure is very complex. It's basically an, an octagon with this giant ribs here with the system where the inside actually supports the outside. And um, it's about 100... Uh, it's about 45 meters wide, it's about um, 150 feet wide, so it's really big. At the very top, this very bow weighs uh, some 20 tons, and it was hit by a lightning a few years after it was made. It was made in the 1471 by Verrocchio, which was the master of Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci went into his workshop to be trained as a, as a painter, as a young teenager. This was hit by a uh, lightning in the, in the 1490s and again in 1600. In 1600, it fell right down on the floor from that high of over 140 meters and it landed right on the side of the cathedral for which there is also a mark on the floor. I won't show you now. That's your quest when you go back to Florence. You can actually look for that. There's a big white patch on the floor which marks the place where the actually giant bronze bow landed uh, in 1601 and then it took a few years to build a scaffolding in a machine actually to put everything back. This is the dome from the inside that has also a cavity in between where you can explore. The fresco was started by uh, Giorgio Vasari, which was the official architect of the Medici at the at the end of 1500, an, an art historian and also the friend, uh, a close friend of Michelangelo. He tried to imitate Michelangelo, so his style is a bit a kind of a wannabe Michelangelo. I don't particularly like him very much because I think that he tried to imitate somebody who was not there to be an example. Michelangelo was a unique artist and that's part of his greatness. Wasn't somebody you could actually try to imitate, replicate, say. Of course, this is the last judgment with the devils at the bottom and the angels at the top. Now, as part of your combined ticket with the um the duomo and the and the bell tower and the you can climb the bell tower too and you can climb also the dome with a ticket that also includes entrance to the museo dell'opera del duomo which is this little museum which is not that little it's a nice museum right behind 
See, I really recommend you to walk around. Now, to go and climb the dome, the entrance is from here, but you need to have a reservation, otherwise they turn you around. And then right at the back, behind the Duomo, there is the um, museo, which is this one, the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo, which basically has hundreds of artworks, including Michelangelo, about the Duomo, some of the original statues which are in the Duomo, the original doors of the um, of the uh, baptistry, which were, of course, for safety, being kept inside. And also they have this super giant model. You can see there's people at the back at the bottom on the corner of the um, of the um, of the Florence um, dome. And uh, the the, uh, the 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 model really shows how Brunelleschi was able to manage to create this magnificent structure, which still today amazes the engineers. You can see the 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 Duomo Museum has a didactic part to show actually the models and replicas and the, the even the death mask of of Brunelleschi, which is a bit gruesome. There's also some of the machines, the pulleys and the scaffolding and all the you know the tools that they use in building the dome, which is really a masterpiece of technology of the 1400s. And there's a number of artworks. In this case, we have uh, the master teaching the pupils, and then we have the philosophers, Plato and Aristotle is here by Luca della Robbia, a number of artworks which decorated you know, the, the Duomo and also the part around the Duomo, the very, very beautiful, of course, statue of saints, and amongst them also the original bronze doors. Again, I hope not to disappoint you, but the doors that you see outside in the actual uh, baptistry, they're copies. They're not the original ones. The original ones, to see them, you have to go inside a museum. And this is, of course, for preservation reasons, people touching and, you know, the birds, the rain. It's it's metal, so it can it's subject to a number of of attacks. And um, this is the first set. There are three sets of doors: the one by, Pisa, by Giovanni Pisano, and then the the other two by uh, Ghiberti. And the this is the ones made in 1401 by Lorenzo Ghiberti. There was then another set. This one here, uh, more modern, very beautiful. I will talk more about this when I mention also Donatello and the. Uh, the new invention of sculpture and bas relief that, uh, based on the ancient Roman uh, art, uh, Donatello basically reinvented, created, and taught to the Florentines. And but this door was um, had a, 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 a very um, fond uh, supporter in Michelangelo, who named that the door of paradise. He said that if uh, paradise has gates, it must be this one because of the beauty of it the result of you know the shiny metal the uh, these are episodes from the old testament here represented and you could see that in a few millimeters you know the artist was able to create this depth with these figures that are some are full round and stick out and some others are just down beneath this is a picture of the replica actually not of the original there are several artworks by donatello by other great masters Pulaiolo. so we'll take just an hour just to talk about that but among the statues that are there, there is the Pietà Bandini, which is one of the Pietas that, that Michelangelo made. This is one towards the end of his career. I really love this one because it's very dramatic. You can see Jesus Christ there is completely abandoned and supported. And there are two elements which really, really, um, I think it's very important. The first of it, it, the entire structure is so imbalanced that you can keep looking and staring at it for hours and you will never get bored. The statue is placed in the middle of a room so you actually walk around and, and experience it fully. It's lit very well. It's never very busy. So it's a perfect museum to explore and appreciate Michelangelo more than, for example, the Academic Gallery, which is very, very crowded. That's where the David is and that's where more Michelangelo's statues are, including the, the, the other Pieta. And here you could see the figure of uh, Nicodemus at the back uh, holding and another a girl on the side holding Jesus Christ. And you can see the perfection of the anatomy, the, dram the dramatic pose of the basically the body being completely abandoned. And part of it was left unfinished. Michelangelo didn't complete it. But even though it's so beautiful to see this unfinished part of Michelangelo with the chisel would work on. Uh, most believe that the figure at the back 
Nicodemus. It's actually a self-portrait by Michelangelo. In fact, it look a lot like yeah, the portrait that we have by Michelangelo. And there is this element of fair, uh, of deep sweetness of the Christ look like if he's asleep, whole with his head against the head of Mary, which actually support her her son's head with her face which is very sweet mother and son relationship i think it's very this moment is very sweet it's very is very very deep in such a large and beautiful and monumental statue speaking of which we the statue that really consecrated michelangelo to be the greatest artist of its time the greatest sculpture of the renaissance and a real symbol of florence and what the renaissance and the medici legacy was was actually the david now as i said there are three davids yes there are three now the original one the one of michelangelo made in 1503 for the then republic of venice because the medici uh lorenzo il magnifico lorenzo the magnificent died in uh, 1492 his son um pietro fado was exiled after two years there was a rebellion as the french army descended to italy they marched through the the uh to Tuscany and challenge so the Florentines said hey this is our land what are you doing we need to stop them but you know the the Pietro Medici was was weak and you know the Medici just decided to get rid of him it wasn't loved very much though and for nearly you know for over two decades basically with no Medici um in in Florence and uh, that's when the uh, statue of the David was made, and it's today in the Galleria dell'Accademia. There is a purpose built tribuna, which is right here, which is built and designed right for that purpose to have the let's see if we can actually pop in. That actually was designed for that reason. But the, the statue that was originally in Piazza della Signoria, which is this father's taken, this is a copy that was made in the, in the second half of the 19th century. And this is one of the only, I think, three copies actually, which was made based on the original, on actually um, a plaster copy that was made of the original one. Now, this is a marble, so this has been sculptured. It's been based on the exact, um, um, uh, basically, mold made on the original David. It's a giant statue, it's about four meters tall or naked David. In fact, having a statue of, an, of a naked man right in the, in the middle of the main square of the city, which is the Palazzo della Signoria, was built in the uh, Middle Ages as the Palazzo dei Priori and later on became the seat of the Medici power. But it was the symbol of the Republic for a long time. And having, oh, this is the David inside in the, in the uh, Galleria dell'Accademia. So it's been here since the uh, 1880s. But before it was here oh uh, let's get to uh, it was okay back it was right here in right by the main door of the palazzo vecchio which means just the old palace, which was the old palace of the government. And uh, this was the first statue. There weren't other statues before. The others were actually added later as a sort of display of what art meant for the Medici. And this marks also the influence that Lorenzo Magnifico had on the on the city of, of Florence. Because if Giovanni di Beach and Pietro, uh, the, 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 the elder, they would have used the money to pay for religious arts uh, with Lorenzo. Lorenzo didn't really care much about religious art anymore. He sponsored mostly pagan art. And they believed in a world in which there were different values and in which the centrality of man or what man can achieve with his power, with his mind, with his art, with his feelings, with his power, it was what that mattered. And this is the real revolution of the Renaissance. That's why we call it is the rebirth of art and culture. But above all, the um, the centrality again of the human being and its possibility in the universe rather than everything being focused on to God. That's why mythology and religious 
uh, religious art kind of you know became less less important and more and most and most artworks were made of pagan art now the david is really masterpiece the anatomical um, precision and beauty it's really amazing the expression it really made um, um Giorgio Vasari say that Michelangelo not just was on the same level of the ancient Roman and Greek sculptures, he was even better than them. It was the first time that, that a modern artist could actually challenge and surpass the statues that were found in Rome and in different parts of Italy being made by the ancient Romans, which were considered the best. Now, this is how the David looked like. This is the Michelangelo one, the original one that had suffered some damages during the centuries. That at some point, because of course it was 19th century, nudity was ooh, so they put a leaf right there. And uh, and this is the picture where they moved him using a scaffolding in the in the 19th century to put it to safety. So for a few decades there wasn't a statue there, and then by the end of the 19th century they put a statue in there. And at the same time, they made a number of copies. So one of those copies made from the original plaster was displayed in another part of Florence for which we have three statues of the David and the other one is in a square overlooking uh, Florence. Usually if you get like a bus tour or driving tour they will take you up here. It's called Piazzale Michelangelo. It's not far from San Minato del Monte. And there is this statue here, which is right, the statue of David. It's a bronze one, this one. It's kind of pastiche because at the bottom there are the copies of another monument that uh, Michelangelo made, which is the Medici tomb in San Lorenzo. And you can see here, it's pretty much the same size. Uh, the, old, the former director of the, of the Uffizi Gallery, Natali, he was, it was, um, it was quite, um, he had a kind of oh, quite strange sense of humor. He he used to prank the lots of Florentines actually, lots of people saying, "Oh no, this is the real, the real the David by Michelangelo." The other ones are copies, which of course is not true. But anyway, this is again another copy. So the three Davids. Uh, without counting the other Davids, like David by Donatello and a few others, which are in the Florentine museums. Now, if we go back to David, this is one of the copies. There were only three copies made originally of the, of the from the first plaster. One was sent to the Queen Victoria. Was sent in to London. It's now in the Victoria and Albert Museum. But when the Queen Victoria saw it, she was horrified that the statue was naked and was deemed inappropriate. So this plaster leaf was expressly made and with two little hooks was actually uh, used to cover uh, the nudity of of the David when the Queen or any member of the royal family was around. I believe they still have that on display. I don't believe they use it anymore. Now, in underneath the Lodge of the Lancy, it's just the lodge next to the uh, Palazzo Vecchio in Piazza della Signoria, there's a number of the statues, both Renaissance statues and Roman statues. This is by an artist called Flaminio Vacca. It's a Roman artist of the Renaissance. And there's some beautiful, beautiful detail. I really love to look the, at the details close up at the statues because you can see the beauty of this statue being out there for hundreds of years. The Palazzo Echo is also a museum. It's the mayor office today, so it's actually a working uh, government building, but you can actually tour it. You can, most people don't know, but you can actually climb inside the tower to the top and look out. Of course, you, again, you have to have good legs. And Bell Tower is not perfectly in line with the center because the building, of course, was built in the Middle Ages, reusing pre-existing building. And then later on was made bigger and bigger when the Medici moved there, all the different offices and the Uffizi Gallery next door was built. Uffizi Gallery was originally an office, which is meant to have all the different offices, which are scattered in different parts of the city, all uh, united and connected to the main palace. Inside, there's a number of painted holes, frescoes, again, by Vasari, other artists of the late Renaissance. And there's a number of stores and things. I really recommend you to visit that. And one of my favorite rooms is this one with the, uh, there's like two meters wide, like seven feet wide, 
globe, which tells us a lot about the interest in also uh, geography and astronomy that the Italians had in the Renaissance, and which led, for example, uh, Christopher Columbus, you know, to do the, the trip around the world. Columbus was originally from Genoa, but anyway, there were other uh, explorers from Florence, like Amerigo Vespucci, which was actually from Florence, and, and was born in Greve, a small village uh, in the Chianti area. And actually, there's still the Castello Vespucci there that you could visit too. Vespucci was the one who discovered um, um, uh, basically the fact that the Americas were um, not, uh, not the East Indies, but were actually their own separate uh, continent. And if we, if we get uh, on. So this is the room with the maps made by, again, by Ignazio Danti, the cartographer, who also designed the maps for the gallery of the maps in Rome and the Vatican. So that's a little connect connection. There's basically the entire world here. And also Galileo Galilei, it was protected by the Medici. He had their support, although, as we know, was excommunicated and buried in non-consecrated ground um, until it was buried in the church only centuries later. And to Galilei, there is an entire museum uh, dedicated, which is along the river Arno. It's not far from the Uffizi. This is the Uffizi gallery here, which... Um, of course, everybody know, and I do a talk just on that, but I won't mention the Uffizi Gallery just today, but everybody knows it's right here. And this horseshoe building was designed by Giorgio Vasari in the second half of the 1500s for Cosimo the I of the Medici. The Medici, the line of Lorenzo Magnifico basically, basically died off with the last of the Alessandro de Medici, Alessandro de Tolmor, the Moor, because it was dark and had curly hair. Uh, basically, he was assassinated uh, by his cousin in the in, uh, 1530s. And then after that, Cosimo I, which was a member of a, another another branch of the Medici family, because it was cousins of, of Lorenzo Magnifico, so they were distant relatives, um, took over and they ruled uh, Florence and Tuscany for a good um, uh, nearly 300 years, 250 years. And uh, right along here, uh, there is right here the, um, the Museo, which is down here, uh, the Museo, no, it's this one here, the Museo Galilei. If we can get here, it's just along the River Arno, for which we have a nice view of the Ponte Vecchio, which is a science museum, but a historical science museum, and tells us a lot about the interest that the Medici and many Italian nobles and scientists had into science. In fact, um, in the Renaissance and the 1600s, Italy was at the avant-garde of the, of the scientific scene, and the... Um, the um, the uh, Galilei Museum is very interesting because it has a number of of, of scientific objects and, and astronomic objects and, and, ge and geographical maps dating back to the to the uh, this is a representation of the of the world with the Medici coat of arms here. It's very complex and very very beautiful. So there was also an academy, a kind of a cultural institution based on the legacy of Galileo whose motto was provando e provando, trying and trying again, which is how experiments are done. You try over and over again till you figure out how things, how things, how things really, really work. Now, let me just see. Okay. And if you have any questions, you can post them in the chat. Now, uh, so that very, I, I'm not very good at explaining this kind of stuff because it's a bit technical for me, but there's an, an amazing a number of, of tools based on navigation and, and cartography. And, and it's very, very interesting, all these uh, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries uh, scientific and astronomical tools. This uh, word representation here is definitely worth the visit. It's beautiful. Something that you would expect to see out of a Harry Potter movie or like, uh, you know, another kind of strange magic magic movie and of course i mentioned the uffizi which is the museum that most people see and the academic gallery which is of course the two must do thing and maybe the third one it would be the Palazzo Vecchio. but if you have a, a taste like i have myself for small private museum there are a number of small museums in Venice that, um, that in, in florence sorry that are amazing apart from the archaeological museum and also the uh Museo del Bargello. Bargello is right behind the, you can recognize because it has a very, you know, tower, a tower very similar to the one of Piazza 
yeah, this tip tower right, right here. This is the Bargello Museum, which was the, Bargello was the head of the police. And so basically this was kind of a prison here it's by the ancient walls of Florence. And you can see this, this is a pretty middle-aged museum with the, the Boga Pontaia here, the Bifora. And here there's a collection of Renaissance art, including the David by Donatello and a few other artworks. So this is another museum to see. But if you really like private personal collections, there are two museums that are unmissable. One is the Museo Bardini. Museo Bardini is, is in a villa, it's, it's kind of the edge of the city. And we can just get there. Oh, that this Villa Bardini, sorry, uh, but, uh, no, Museo Bardini, we'll, we'll search for it here. So Bardini was a um, collector, yeah, Museo Stefano Bardini, was a collector of, of, um, of um, uh, antiquities, antiquarian uh, merchants, basically, but um, he was quite wealthy and he decided to leave all of his collection basically to his um to the city of, of florence so for over 100 years this palace has been a museum and but then he basically lived and and traded at the time where a lot of neighbors especially in this area here the old ghetto and other parts Piazza Repubblica, were completely torn down and rebuilt and they call that the risanamento basically it was a sort of way to restore and recreate a city which we had more modern and so this entire neighbor was completely rebuilt and um and so the actual there were a number of building demolished and things there down so there were a lot of artifacts from churches and from other um other um, uh, convents which were closed down and and palaces which had been destroyed that were available for the for the international antique market now these are pictures of an exhibition and then so you could see that he collected he bought a palace and in this historical Florentine palace which is kept very well he placed a number of roofs that came from different palaces uh, some are also venetians by the way and then a number of marble plagues inscriptions and and crucifix and madonnas of course because immediately there's madonnas everywhere and in these are cassapanche basically they were they were the equivalent of a wardrobe back then you didn't hang your clothes in a wardrobe you basically put them in a box like that and um and so it's very beautiful plus there would be virtually no crowds in there it's a nice walk along the river arno to get on the old town on the other side and you can see all this kind of weird coat of arms and the images of saints the decoration from the from the from the gothic and renaissance art it's a several stories so you need a you know a couple a couple of you know an hour and a half two hours it's really really nice and also it's in a quieter area of 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 florence and then you if you want you can climb up to the giardino bandini from which we have an amazing view over over the 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 city of of florence the the villa bandini you see as a beautiful belvedere you can see the entire city of florence as well and it's connected basically at the very top it's a wonderful garden one thing that people really miss when visit florence is that there isn't much green space in the city center not in the historical one you can either go to the public gardens but there are actually a number of villas and gardens that you could see the villa Bardini is actually one of the most central ones and also very spectacular because of the views but it's not very very difficult to reach so this is still pictures of the of the Bardini museum you can see this all came from different churches and palaces and places destroyed so he collected them all to sell them but then as he was making a lot of money he kept a lot a lot of them another museum which is in the same kind of similar way but it's a bit more uh, specific is the Stibbert Museum. Frederick Stibbert, it was actually, uh, it was born in Florence, but was a son of a very wealthy British um, uh, man from Norfolk. His grand commander of the East Indies Company uh, for the British Empire at the beginning of the 19th century, he made a fortune and managing the trade with the with the indies and um and so uh, frederick he inherited the family money and he had it didn't have to work all his life so what he did and the villa stibbert is right on the edge 
pass normally so you need you know it'd be this would be a quite an expensive uh, tra uh taxi ride but there's there's some sort of public transportation or you can arrange a car and the Stibbert museum is very very interesting because it's um no sorry it's wrong deck it's basically um i have the yeah this is the official page of the museum it's basically a sort of mansion of this Frederick Stippert who the only thing that he did all his life it was to collect art and he collected especially armors and even Asian uh, Japanese art so this is like 18th century furniture although he he lived at the, the second half of the 19th century. You could see a part of the villa was, was custom built for him as he collected, um, I think he has some 60,000 objects. So it's an amazing amount of objects. There are paintings, there are artworks, but the main thing is these rooms with the rides or knights. Now, this is something that looks like scam out of the movie, which is a, a broomstick, that old Disney movie about the witch that makes things come alive. And if you have kids or if you're an interest in ancient armory and Renaissance armory and even Japanese armors, that's the place to go. And I really like the fact that this really immerses you into history because, of course, there are the mannequins, there are the knights all dressed up and the, the rooms were all made in the 19th century to, to look like they were middle age. But it's really, really something. I think I don't think the Florentines, especially two guys of the two companies, they don't really um, push this place too much because if to to us it feels that it doesn't fit the narrative of Florence or it doesn't fit the story that we tell about Florence, the Medici, blah blah blah, Michelangelo, that kind of stuff. But there's a lot more to that, and I think this is a good um, it's a good experience if you if you love exotic um, armors. This is from the from the east and and there were also some japanese ones which i can find it now but there's also a display of japanese armors which i really love there is something similar like this also in venice in the capeso uh which is also a large collection of of of, of armors and now if we get back to piazza la signoria of course there's the david here with the with the crowds these pictures i took a few years back and in the lodge dei lanzi there is another amazing statue the pursues made by benvenuto cellini now cellini he was a kind of a uh, it was an artist a jeweler one of the greatest masters of jewelry of florence which have their main um uh, basically business area on the Ponte Vecchio and also on the Porta Rossa, which is actually, uh, you know, this road down here. And that's what the song before I play at the beginning was was talking about. Now, the uh, the tradition is still there as Goldsmith. And actually, right in the middle of the Ponte Vecchio, there is the statue dedicated to, um, to, uh, to the artist, to um benvenuto cellini cellini was actually even arrested because he was asked by the pope to make some jewels and and he actually instead of using the gold and jewels to make the thing for the pope he actually sold them to pay one of his previous debts so of course the pope was wanted his artwork and he arrested him and another thing you could see which is peculiar of the florentine renaissance is the accuracy the knowledge of the human body look at the muscles of the statue the body is amazing looks like out of a cabinet of an of, a, of an you know an anatomy uh, an ato anatomic theater here with all the even single each single muscle being perfectly um, made and then even the support is right at the front of the statue had an number as artworks within the artworks the statue on the top is amazing but it's even more amazing all the calves bottom and then here you could see also the bas relief round that tell of course the story of Perseus flying up there from above and um, speaking of geniuses of course Leonardo da Vinci is the master of uh, you know whose legacy is connected with Florence and later on this month I'll do a talk about Leonardo da Vinci especially his private life his secrets his personal challenges so we'll see a more intimate view of Leonardo da Vinci this is underneath the gallery of the Uffizi right on the on the ground floor on the outside there's a number of statues again made in 19th century of all the great geniuses of Florence and of Tuscany among them there's also Leonardo da Vinci while on the other side of Piazza della Signoria there is the statue of Cosimo the first of the Medici which is the one who restore the 
uh, rule of the Medici. But how did the Medici created this legacy? We saw about the banking and the money, but how did they decided to invest all this in money? How did it represent themselves? Now, the Medici, here you could see Lorenzo the Medici on the right. This bust is actually in New York, uh, it's in Washington, D.C. And the one on the left, it's a portrait of one of the Magi kings as you could see in the chapel of the Magi in this palace, Palazzo Medici Riccardi. In fact, when with the first money, the Medici built a number of buildings to that were sponsored in order to basically uh, impress their mark on Florence. One of them was the Convent of San Marco, which is again a beautiful museum with the frescoes by Frangelico. It's well worth a visit. There's also display and work on of Flangelico, if you love lo, uh, 14th, uh, 15th century art, it's the place to go. This became a center of philosophy. Also, Michelangelo was trained here in this in the school of of art that the uh, is right here. Sorry, I've lost them now. It's this one here. Um, so it, in here in the court, it was basically a school where the young artists were trained and they were paid for by the Medici. Another building was the Church of San Lorenzo, when there are also the large chapel here. This is where all the tombs of the Medici are, and this is the San Lorenzo market. By the way, if you go right here where there are all these stools, they all sell leather stuff. Inside this green pavilion, this is a modern food market. On the top floor, there's a fantastic display of food where you can eat traditional Tuscan food, you can eat a bowl of pasta for like a fiver, and you can eat like nice pasta made there on the moment. You can eat pizza, you can eat steaks, you can eat even Asian food. There's a bit of everything, and you can just, you know, get your own uh, thing and just eat in the central hall. It's really a nice place where to have a nice lunch with a number of different specialties. It's a food market that actually has on the ground floor the actual selling selling like food like in a in a, in a supermarket like where you actually buy the the food like like in a, in a kind of a deli store but on the top there's actual restaurants where you can actually eat and um and then there's the, of course the church and library of, of of san lorenzo this also was sponsored by the medici and down the road the palazzo medici riccardi which is now a, a museum and a public office which actually has is right here has inside this masterpiece uh, like with the Cappella dei Magi, which I want to see. Cappella dei Magi. Yes. <coughs> now, in the museum, there are several rooms you can visit. But this is amazing. This is where the Medici basically represented their own legacy by representing and giving a positive image of money, of wealth. In fact, of all the religious art, which one is the probably the only moment when wealthy men, rich people in the gospel are basically seen as good people? Usually, you know, the gospel says, oh, no, you should give away all your rich to the poor and live with the poor because it's easier for a poor to get to the heavens than for rich. And um, these are the Magi kings. These were those who wrote from East bringing, uh, you know, uh, all gold, incense, and, and, and a mirror. You know what mirror is? Do you actually use mirror? No? Well, actually um oh, bob is saying a grand nostalgia yeah hopefully i mean italy is pretty open now so i've got people traveling now and it's you have to you know you have to wear a mask and do all the thing and this and this but all museums and everything is open there's in a little bit of you know you have to test take a test and but you don't have to quarantine so it's it's pretty open i'm not sure about the flight situation but european flight seems now to be relatively stable and um, anyway there are others people riding here and actually these are the members of the of the of the medici family um I'll show you the detail now the the chapel is only small and of course they are the medici bowls the powers this symbol here now medici in in italian means medic so most people will tell you oh no this the bowls on the medici coat of arms which has six 
traditionally the seventh was added when Cosimo was made Grand Duke and so he had an extra bow to his coat of arms with the full the least the symbol of Florence so the family became the city and the city became the family became one thing in the 1500s but um, they will tell you oh these are pills the Medici medics so the pills on the coat of arms no these were coins it was there were money later on they were made nice and into both but their first called coat of arms the coat of arms of Gianni di Bici, he had coins monies on the coat of arms because it was a money lender so and that's why Pietro uh, the Medici basically which is here is this one here on the left um riding on a on a donkey not even on a horse it was you know he, he was kind of keeping a low profile it's those kind of men who hard work out all their life they spend a, a fair amount of money but they didn't overspend they saved built a, a big fortune but they kept a low profile they never get any public office and any public functions they rule the city but on a very low profile so you know taxman doesn't come after you and still a way that lots of people do business in Italy that way today with his star next to him pietro and then this one is a kind of a it's it's not a portrait but symbolized lorenzo magnifico and they were building they were giving wealth and riches look they come with all this parade of people and servants amongst them there's also a number of people portrait including the pope down there here and then there's also the the emperor constantinople and another wealthy people of that time and and important lords and uh, who all came to pay homage after the Medici. the Medici represented one of the wealthiest families of the of the 1400s this was made and in, in the middle of 1400s and um, pietro chose one of the most talented pupils of um, Bardo Angelico, whose name is Benozzo Gozzoli, who painted this beautiful, this beautiful fresco. And you can see they're dressed very, they're very flashy. Florence at the time was a city where people loved to dress very nicely, use fur and gold and this beautiful red and the velvets. And that's where the 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 Italian fashions come from, from this wealthy man who wanted to show their wealth and they wanted to, you know, basically made a statement out of that, but yet, you know, not overdoing it. So they created that perfect taste that is still one of the trademarks, something unique that you can find in Italy and that the French are desperately trying to imitate. Um, I'm sorry for anyone from France. Amongst them, there's also the portraits, of course, of the Medici themselves including Lorenzo you could see him here actually he's got a little broken nose he had and then it's his brother here Giuliano which is always brother is looking down on the floor all the time and few other uh, lords and and rulers of Ferrara and other towns in central Italy these are all portraits of contemporary people that really were the ruling class of Italy at that time and here it's Pietro on the left his son here and then um, uh, Pietro il um, no this is this is Pietro's son and uh, no he's, he's oldest son and then the um, I'm sorry the youngest son and then this one here on the first is Pietro the Gautry now the um, the Medici they ate very rich food um, you know a lot of uh, um, uh, kidneys and and sausages and and food very rich meats uh, and, and and stuff really 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 rich and they all had gautry and, and pietro actually died quite young of out of gautry um so they represented the magi kings bearing gifts to the child so the wealthy people honoring the lord and they, they were the ones who basically acknowledged the camp of the christ so it uh, that's the, how they changed um you know the the religious art into a political message now there's another thing that the medici did but this is about generation later it's the vasari corridor which was basically passing over the Ponte Vecchio, which is the only bridge that the Nazi didn't blow up when they left Italy. And you could see it from distance. The other bridges were rebuilt after World War II. It was damaged partially the Ponte Vecchio, but not too bad. But a real, uh, you know, and the, in, in uh, the second half of the, of the 16th century, uh, Vasari built for Cosimo de' Medici this aerial passage from the Uffizi, went all the way over the Ponte Vecchio, to the Palazzo Pitti, which was basically the palace that the Medici had built. And now we enter into the, the, the 
Basari corridor. At the moment, it's closed. It, I think it will be closed for another two years because they're restoring it. They, they had for decades the uh, series of the self-portrait of artists, hundreds of paintings of self-portrait of artists, all in this Pernod Gallery. Now they want to get more people inside. So they've removed the artworks and it would be used for timber exhibitions and stuff. And would be open to the public regularly, I think, for 20, 2033. We can have a look inside in this video, it goes very fast, but you can actually see inside this it's how it goes from basically the Uffizi down all the way out to over the, the here we are over the Ponte Vecchio. Uh, we look at the Arno on the left and on the right we're actually looking on the, on the bridge and then talk on the other side. I know actually this bit is the one on the bridge and then it is here it's on the bridge sorry the large wind is on the bridge the other one was along the, the river Arno this action on the bridge and then we go off the bridge and down to the bobbly gardens and you can see there used to be there's still the marks here of the where the paint, paintings were were hanged uh, you see and which have been removed and this is during the restoration and now there'll be a different display but of course they have to repaint assess so thanks for it but be glorious once it'll be done and here it is down by the grotto the Bontalenti in you see in the bubbly gardens now from here um florence had the really actually italy had a really bad flaw in 1966 there was a flaw that damaged the city uh the the library of florence which is one of the most important in the world it was flooded the artworks were damaged also the uffizi and also venice was flooded there was a, a a, a pungent smell of 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 the diesel because of course of everything had been come out of the of the tanks of the cars and petrol and the water was up to seven eight feet high through two or three meters high so really was a really a challenging time for the city and that was only you know 20 years after the end uh, after the end of world war ii so it was about to re recover and the italian economy was booming but this also led to uh, you know um, a more understanding of the environment and how protection and the conservation projects is especially for example for venice the save venice project was actually started back then in the 60s and so also many initiatives from florence anyway on the other side of the arno oltranno area there is the palazzo pitti this magnificent palace uh, you see we get here this is the Fasari corridor all through here zigzag and then we are around here that's where it ends down here at the at the um, there are there is this beautiful mansion which was bought by Cosimo de Primo de Medici actually the wife Eleonora di Toledo uh, was from Naples she wanted the mansion the mansion was much smaller it was built by the Pitti family and then ba basically over the centuries they made bigger and bigger the first floor has beautiful apartments that is like you know a royal palace with frescoes by uh Piero da Cortona and an, an art gallery and collection there's a, a silver a silver glass museum uh pottery there's a um clothes and there is a um a galleria palatina which is a painting gallery there's a number of different collections and there are the beautiful bobbly gardens which are fantastic although i really recommend either to see the foreigners up here at the top or the giardino bandini which is just on the other side which is is very very good it's right here the giardino bandini is this one here with the one we saw before uh this is the ancient walls of florence if you're arriving from the south you can even from the piazzale michelangelo walk all the way down to the Porta Romana down here. This is the ancient southern wall of Florence. The walls in the north part of Florence are not preserved. They were knocked down in the 19th century and now there's a road going on. But the south part still has the ancient medieval uh, walls, which might be interesting. And then you can actually walk from here and enter here and walk through the gardens. And then, of course, you need a ticket. And then you can actually see the beautiful, beautiful gardens here the Palazzo Pitti. the museum is also where world is and this is the area called as Ultran. we can have the Ospedale di Santo Spirito and the Convent of Santo Spirito this is where Michelangelo studied anatomy he was given the permission to study the corpses and in exchange he made a crucifix which actually been acknowledged as being a Michelangelo 
a wooden crucifix which is inside this 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 church now this is the back side of the boboli gardens and the Passo Pitti that also has a obelisk inside why the medici have an obelisk where does this obelisk come from well it came originally from egypt but this one was taken in rome by the medici now another thing that you might find in the in the south part of venice there's a number i really love this area because it's quieter and also there's a number of of beautiful chapels including the the brancacci chapel in the chiesa del carmine which is this one which probably in the next two years will be closed for restoration but check it out because it's a beautiful renaissance uh, chapel made by Masaccio, Masonino da Parigale. At the beginning of 1400s, it's one of the early uh, Renaissance artworks. And um, in this area, there's also a number of drinking places, and there's also quite a number of these little windows, the very small, they're called buchette. What do you think of this for? Let's see if you can, um, if you can uh, point out if you can guess what this is i think they made also a, a couple you see it's a uh, vino there are little doors but they're only about like uh, 20 30 centimeters tall under a foot tall they are buca da vino so this is dates back to the plague when you know not to have contact with people they actually passed the wine through the little door of the of the wine place and this uh, made the news again last year because during the COVID times where you couldn't actually enter can only do take take out uh, some wine merchants and some wine pubs in the center of Florence they said oh we got this thing that was made by our ancestors during the plague in the 1600s or whatever let's do them again and so they actually passed on the bottle of wine, the glass of wine through the little bouquet of vino. So there's about, uh, I know of about uh, 20 or just under 20. I'm not sure if there are more, but there's actually a tour you could take just of this bouquet, which is a kind of a wine crawler. I'm not sure how many glasses of wine you could take. I guess 20, there'll be. They're a, bit, they're a bit much but uh a nice uh it's, the evening is not too hot it might be a work and this is of course florence seen from above now there's um a number of vista points uh, but you could actually get to um uh, to florence if you want to get outside most people go to chianti but uh fiesole it's an ancient roman town right outside of of florence on the hills so actually the ruins and there's a beautiful uh, view over florence that picture is taken from there and if you could there you go there for like the aperitivo around six to seven when there's still light and you can actually book a dinner there's a place which is michelin star restaurant villa san michele florence which will cost you an eye probably i think you're in the range of four five hundred euros or more for for a, men, a meal but at uh, the setting is amazing is this well you don't have to stay there you can just book the restaurant and, and it's a it, they got a michelin star a restaurant just overlooking you know just overlooking florence and it's an amazing experience if you want to treat yourself for a special occasion of course florence is full of really good restaurants where you can eat 25 30 dollars you can eat a nice you know meal good wine the good thing about italy and it's also kind of downside some somehow it's like there's so much good food very affordable that there's not that many michelin star restaurants not that many uh high-end restaurants of course florence has a certain number of them but they're not as many as like london or new york or other cities another beautiful vista point it's the um san Miniato del monte right just next to the piazza Michelangelo. Michelangelo. i think he loved wandering up there enjoying the view on the city and it's a beautiful abbey dating back to the middle ages with also an historic cemetery and if you are into that kind of stuff there's people who love touring cemeteries i'm not a big fan of cemeteries myself but i know there's people who like that and and it's a beautiful it's a beautiful um um renaissance facade with that kind of again the the green and and white and the beautiful um monastery and it's very beautiful the view from there it's a good hike from florence but it's doable you can do it even from the center on a good day the only thing that actually 
I don't know if it's just me, but I, I think you'll agree. If it's too hot in the day, climbing under the sun in the heat, the problem with Florence in the summer is that because it's in a in a kind of a valley, and it's quite far from the sea, there isn't much breeze, so it gets really really hot and sticky in the summer. So um, you might want to do things more in the evening. This is the facade of San Miniato Al Monte, which takes us down to Florence again. We are about to wrap this up, and then if you have questions, I'll be glad to take them. There are a number of, uh, uh, of course, historical churches. One that I love the most, it's um, it's basically uh, Santa Maria Nova, uh, Santa Croce in Jerusalem. I'm sorry, uh, Santa Croce. I'm just getting a bit tired after an hour and a half we, we're about to wrap this up and santa Croce, it's like it's also very peculiar because as you know florence was you know divided into into, into several um into several uh independent um into this is Beth Santa Grosha, into several independent uh, <coughs> kingdom for a long time. But in the 19th century, sorry if I drink from the bottle, but I have experience if I drink from a glass and if I knock down the glass on the computer, that's the end of the tour. Um, so this is the kind of place that in the 19th century it became naturally kind of the place where to bury the great italians the, those who had basically made um made italy uh, great so the great artists the great uh, poets the great scientists and um, santa croce is right here so this is a uh, piazza signoria just uh, three blocks back that is the square right here and it's a nice gentle stroll and there's in the in this alleys there's plenty of little shops and leather shops and fashion shops and it's, it's really really nice uh walk and down here you could see um the complex is very beautiful also full of art there's also um a wonderful bookshop that makes um you know they make uh, leather and 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 they have very nice uh, shops also inside the place um i'll make leather and paper and stuff which is you know if you like that kind of stuff is really really nice that this became the place where the times commemorate the great artists and thinkers and and authors and and the equivalent of like the panel in Paris or uh, um, Westminster Abbey in London where the great artists and, 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 and writers are buried. And usually this is in the capital, like the Pantheon is in Paris for France, uh, the Westminster Abbey is in London for, for England. Italy is not in Rome because Rome only became the capital of Italy in the 1870s. And so there was this idea that most of the Italian culture, or at least the culture what was famous in the world and made us proud, came from Florence, from the Renaissance, from the poetry, from Dante Alighieri, who is the poet who lived in the 12th, 1300s, and he is considered the father of Italian language, one of the greatest poets ever, who's this year is the 700 years anniversary since he died. Dante is not buried in Florence. It was a Florentine, but he was involved in politics. Hence, he was exiled because he supported the wrong party. So his side basically def was defeated and he was exiled. But this statue is right here outside the Santa Croce. And there is a tomb inside, which is actually a cenotaph. So it's uh, it's empty. It's fake. I'm just disappointed to give you a lot of like um, kind of a, um, well, not fake, but like you know stuff that is not a hundred percent real. Let's get inside Santa Croce. Back and. There's a number of, of course, this is the main altar with frescoes. It's a beautiful church, but there's a number of tombs inside, which are, of course, the tombs of the um, of the great of the great Italians, which I have a few. Now, Dante Alighieri is also connected with another great artist, Botticelli, which about hundred years after he died, created these beautiful images and illustrations of the Divine Comedy of this masterpiece. And I'm speaking about um Botticelli and in a couple of weeks I'm going to make a talk specifically on, on Sandro Botticelli and his legacy and his art and how he 
is the one that I think above all embodies the ideal of the Renaissance art is uh, of the um, in, in he inherited the ideas that are in Dante and in the Neoplatonic school of Florence. This is the, that is it. Sandro Botticelli, his own his own self portrait, and this is his tomb and his family tomb in in uh, in central florence will discover the air where he was from what, what was his legacy and and most of these artworks he and inside the santa croce there's the tomb of galileo galilei galilei of vittorio alfieri the tomb of michelangelo which is here on the left where michelangelo is buried and also the cenotaph the kind of empty tomb of dante Alighieri. this was made much later it was made in the eight in the, in the 19th century but yeah, you know, it was kind of a way that Florence was kind of say sorry to one of his best citizens and the greatest artist, one of the greatest artists the city I've ever had. Uh, the, the for sure the, the greatest poet, the one who basically is considered the father of Italian language, and it just you know was saying sorry for exiling him, Florence is back, and I do believe there's never too late to say sorry if and even if it's under after hundreds of years um and in the same square in june uh at the end of june where there's the saint john's day 24th of june it's the, the day of the patron saint of florence uh, san giovanni um uh to which a baptistry is dedicated to uh, in the square in front of santa croce there is the santa croce there's also the patsy chapel right here it's not a beautiful building it's right the chapel out here there's a number of cloisters and it's very very beautiful um here they do the crazy calcio fiorentino which is the original kind of soccer which is a mixture of soccer and boxing and fighting a sort of italian rugby but with no protection and just rough on the hands you can see which it's the culture fiorentino which has been revived recently and you could see this vitelloni we call them in italian these big lads that actually this uh, big muscly sweaty men fighting each other I do not personally. I do not enjoy particularly the sport in general, the soccer. But I guess I can see people liking it. You know, big men. I mean, it, back in the Renaissance, they didn't they didn't have tattoos. Tattoos in the Roman times and also in in a Renaissance, that was something that was made uh, to mark the slaves or the prisoners. Um, so you wouldn't see them back then. But now they in Italy they're very popular. I would see most people under forty there have several tattoos now. They're really, really uh, popular, um, and you see, they are different teams in different colors. No protection of any kind, bare chest, and just you know, no medical insurance, I guess, and just get on with it. And the more bleed, the more marks. You see, all of them they have like a, the faces; they're not perfectly symmetrical they have a broken nose broken check uh, something but I, I most i think most people will find them sexy i don't know so and this of course are the historical colors there's a number of historical celebration of florence the city of florence still does like the magi procession still done and a number of uh the easter scopil car there's a number of traditions is still popular there but this is definitely something to see if you're into sports and you you know i read constantly people criticizing contact sports like rugby of course you can get hurt but they wear all protection imagine this, this guy is here so this i think is now yeah it's done in the summer but uh, it's if you are then in the summer i'm not sure if they're doing it right now but they might now thank you very much for following me sorry about the facebook uh problem that it will be um on, online posted on facebook uh soon um there were a few hundreds tonight so if you you will receive an email tomorrow with also the links to the next upcoming events tomorrow at uh, 9 p.m uh brome time italian time so it would be 8 in england and would be 3 p.m in the east coast in the us and uh 1 or no, 12 p.m in the other coast of the pacific and in between you know you can do the maths um i'll be doing a paid talk the talk there's a ticket of 12 euros um uh, about ravenna 
uh, the capital of Mosaic. Sarena was this the city in uh, in Emilia Romagna, which was the capital of the Roman Empire while the Roman Empire was failing, and had this beautiful Christian art when the empire was Christianized. And this is the the tomb of Galatia Shidia, this imperial woman, which basically was born into an imperial family that was kidnapped by the by the Goths, by the barbarians, was made marry a barbarian chieftain, and then later on this this guy died she, she was relieved and she was married to a roman general which she, probably she hated as much as the of the of the barbarian chieftain and he died as well so he she actually ruled as the mother of the emperor for a few years and the legacy is really interesting is very tough woman so not very not very many times in history you have a nice uh, important depiction of a of a woman of a lady and i think she really stands out and we need to learn more about her and the mosaics uh, made in 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 uh, the, the, around two three hundred years in 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 Ravenna still perfectly preserved are very very beautiful in this beautiful Palo Christian church so and it's also the place where Dante Alighieri is buried so I think there's a very strong link so we'll see more about how Dante ended up being exiled from Florence and then you know ended up to to Ravenna where he died but um, for that, that was actually good to be uh, kicked out of politics because then he wrote one of the greatest masterpieces of universal literature. One of the greatest things that mankind has always had been written is like there, like Shakespeare or Goethe or one of the great Homer, like one of the great um, uh, writers. Now, um, and then I'll, I'll do more uh, virtual talks saturday and sunday you could find the program this month is dedicated to the renaissance so next saturday we'll explore donatello and his artworks and then michelangelo and his life especially as a sculpture but also as an artist and then botticelli and again leonardo you can also book four tours for 40 euros so you can actually get a good deal if you book four tours they don't have to be four in a row you can actually decide which ones and then there will be a break in the summer and i will continue giving this virtual tour so in this summer i'll concentrate on developing our viral in-person tour as we can so we're taking bookings right now you can get a free quote online for a custom-made tour or also joining one of us of our travel of our tour experiences and um and then from um again uh in the summer there'll be a few more in july and then again there'll be break until the um the end of september where we'll be starting every weekend giving more and more virtual tours have been you know very successful people usually really love them there will be both free tours where you can join and if you want and you appreciate that you can you know donate there's a link in this page at the bottom and also uh at, on our website where you can and you will also receive an email where you can actually get uh, um donate uh a little something if you really uh, if you have appreciated this tour now let me get the music uh right and then we can we can see i have a little surprise here because this is a traditional no sorry traditional uh florentine song in italian i don't know if you have any questions or anything you'd like to ask Adolo. they're getting lost in the city it's the way of learning how to uh how to travel do you have any questions or anything you want to ask about florence um from maryland from poland oh it's quite late in poland so ontario canada ohio florida oregon well, all over the world croatia for Lauderdale, Cairo, South Coast of England, Bosnia, Skopje, wow, Nova Scotia, and there's this place, I don't know what it is, British Columbia, okay, um, yeah, you get lost in Italy, it's always, you know, uh, the best way to explore, to find surprises, to find um, best best places, okay, uh, I play the music, I will be still available, if you have any question, you can ask them, you can just post your question on.